and welcome to The Spectrum Show, a show dedicated to the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Coming up in this episode, we go back to April 1984 to get all the Sinclair news and latest Spectrum releases, I finally get my hands on a Spectrum Plus 3, we review some older games, and take a look at some newer titles. But first, it's back into the time machine in April 1984. Sinclair are still causing anger by missing deadlines yet again. The problemed QL launch has been dogged with issues around technical problems, meaning that no QL has yet been delivered. Sinclair are still saying the machines are imminent, but can't give a definite date. A dongle will also be provided with the initial batch, holding sections of the operating system that could not be fitted internally. This was one of the reasons for the delays, as the original system design could not hold all of the OS and DiscOS on its original 32K ROM. Sinclair's revolutionary new joystick design has been shelved after market research has shown that users would not accept it. The device is a cross between a joystick and a modern mouse, with a spring-loaded top half acting as a control mechanism, pushing down on the right-hand side, for example, would mimic a joystick being moved right. Sadly, we'll never get to see this unit as it only exists in prototype format. Parker Brothers will be the first independent software company to produce titles for the Spectrum's Interface 2 ROM format. The programs are set to be released in August and will include arcade favourites Qbert, Popeye, Gyrus, Star Wars and Return of the Jedi. As mentioned in previous episodes, the anti-piracy device seized by the MOD will never see the light of day, but earlier versions are allowed to be used. One of the first companies to use them commercially will be a &F, who claim that the system is 99% secure, and that anyone trying to copy their game will have a very difficult time of things. The system, called Imprint 2, is written into the actual program and is matched with further layers of audio at duplication. This means that it will be tricky to beat. And now on to the top selling games. New entries into this month's chart include software projects follow up to Manic Miner, Jet Set Willy. We also have Ocean's version of the famous arcade game Cuba in Pogo. Quicksilver are still catching in on the pre-Christmas sales with Snowman. And finally the pyramid exploration game Fred. And that was the news and charts from April 1984. For me, the Spectrum Plus 3 was the computer I always wanted but never had, for a number of reasons, mainly because it came too late in the Spectrum's lifespan. It was released in 1987, at which time more powerful 16-bit computers like the Amiga and Atari were already available, wowing the public with their superior graphics, sound and storage options. It was also not a real Sinclair computer, Sir Clive having sold off his prodigy to Alan Sugar's Amstrad in the previous year. So this machine was the best bits of the Amstrad CPC range, the keyboard, connectivity and built-in storage, plus the best bits of the Spectrum, massive games catalogue, easy to use, and a thriving copying community. The Plus 3 was the last of the Spectrums, and in many people's eyes it was the best, but it still had its faults though. The machine itself was larger than previous machines, nearly twice as big as the rubber keyed version, and a third larger than the Spectrum Plus. It was heavier too, that was because of the built-in floppy drive. The 3 inch drive was the same as the one used in the Amstrad CPC range, capable of holding around 350k per disc, across two sides. The drive only had one read write head though, so the disc had to be turned over to read the contents of the other side of the disc. Speed wise it was a huge step up from tapes, loading a typical 48k game in around 3 to 5 seconds, depending on how it was stored on the disc and whether it included things like a loading screen. New commands were added to the ROM to allow for cataloguing, formatting, reading, writing, erasing and moving files to and from the disk. But because there was only one drive, you could use the RAM drive as temporary storage. The case is a sturdy piece of plastic. Under the Spectrum range, the Plus 3s are thought of as the most robust. The keyboard, again taken from the CPC range, is another big step up from the Plus machine, offering real keys and a nice solid feel, and a lovely sound as well. There are single keys for certain characters like quotes or delete, and the familiar keywords of the 48k days are no longer to be found, apart from the odd, well-used command like load. If you switch to 48k mode though, they're still there, 
but 128k BASIC offers a much better typing experience and you don't have to look for the commands on the keys, just type them in fully. Connectivity wise there are two joystick ports for Sinclair joysticks on the left hand side, next to the reset button. At the back there's the normal ZX expansion port, featuring some annoying changes that means that some peripherals no longer work. There's also an expansion for an external disk drive, alongside a Centronics parallel printer interface. At last there's a video out socket that allows the use of SCART cables, a big improvement over RF, which is still available if required. There's an audio socket too to load and save to tape, so you can still load all your old games. There's also an RS-232 serial port that can double up as a MIDI port, and an auxiliary port. Usage wise we get the familiar 128k start screen, offering a variety of choices. If there's a disc in the drive it will try and load that, if not it will wait for a tape signal. Once in BASIC there's another menu that allows full screen editing, renumbering, printing or exiting back to the main menu. On the downside Every Plus 3 had a built in sound fault. Sound via the television was distorted due to an error on the PCB. There are various ways to fix this issue and they can be found on the internet. Sadly though I've not been brave enough to attempt it yet. The other common fault was the drive belt. This often decays leaving the drive inoperable. Luckily you can get replacement belts quite easily and quite cheaply. Software wise there were titles commercially available on disc, some exclusively so, like those from Magnetic Scrolls. Companies released compilations of their older 48k titles too, and often sold two versions of their newer games, one on tape and one on disc. Loading and saving to disc was nowhere near as complex as using a ZX microdrive, there were no strange commands to remember. Loading and saving used the same commands as tape, but because the A drive was the default storage system, the Plus 3 used that. Simple. My Plus 3 has been permanently set up right beside my PC since it arrived, and I've spent many a good hour converting my old games across and saving them to disc and building little boot menus. It's everything I ever wanted out of a Spectrum in the 80s, and although it isn't a Sinclair machine, it still has that special something. The 47 Thunderbolt was released quite late in the Spectrum's life, 1990 to be exact, and it is, if you didn't know, a version of the arcade game P47 Phantom Fighter. The arcade game was a multicoloured wonder of horizontal shoot 'em up action, with everything you came to expect, like power ups and boss battles. The Spectrum version, for me, seemed fairly flat in comparison, with hardly any sound, even on a 128K machine, and the little sound there was consisted of the same beep no matter what you did. This was 1990, what were they really thinking? The game has various levels, which are handled via a multi-load system, each with its own distinct graphics, but usually the same type of enemy. There tends to be specific level enemies that show up halfway through, like horizontal missiles on the first level for example, or larger diagonal missiles on level 2. The landscape is monochrome and scrolls smoothly enough, but level 2 just made my eyes bleed. Yes it's parallax, but really? Are you saying the colours couldn't have been used better? The gameplay starts off okay, but soon becomes monotonous. The power-ups don't help, giving you little in the way to survive. I found myself prodding the fire key continually and not actually getting into the game at all. Because I had recently lost a life, the end of level boss on level 1 took ages to kill, and once you'd found the sweet spot, it was just a matter of sitting there prodding the fire key. The Spectrum was never going to match the lush colours of the arcade machine though, but I think they could have made a better effort than what was released. Something doesn't seem right as well, it's as though the game was never completed, especially when you consider the control panel graphics, they look slightly corrupt. As it is then, I think this game is average at best, and I usually like shoot 'em ups, but to me this seems like lazy programming. Paratroopers was released by Rabbit Software in 1983, and was written by John Kane. John later went on to bring us some classics like Booty and Marble Madness, but this is from a much earlier time. I found this game in a batch of old games recently given to me by a friend. The cassette inlay looks cheap, and the game itself is 16k, well actually it's just short of 7k, and strangely has two loading screens. 
According to the inlay, life gets lonely sitting in your bunker with only a greasy ack ack gun to converse with while waiting for the enemy to drop in, and your task, when they do arrive, is to shoot them and stop them landing. The player controls a nicely animated gun at the bottom of the screen, which can fire at various angles to destroy the enemy choppers. The paratroopers are released randomly, and your aim is to stop them, either by shooting their parachutes so that they fall to the ground and explode, or shooting them instead, in which case they explode. If five of them do manage to land, then the game is over, and something very nasty happens, but more about that later. One thing you have to remember also, is that each shot you take will reduce your overall score, so you have to be careful, and that adds an extra layer onto the game. It's a very simplistic game, despite the varying things you have to remember, and my initial play didn't last very long, or enthuse me in any way at all. I was however reviewing it, so I played it again, and again, and again, and my score gradually increased. It's a kind of game that can draw you in, and it's a pity you've only got one life. Yes, it has simple graphics, yes, it's got simple sound, and yes, it does slow down when there are lots of things happening on screen. But after a few plays, it begins to grow on you, and without noticing, you start another game straight away. Not that you get any choice in the matter. As soon as you die, the next game begins. Now back to the end of game moment. I have no idea why, but once five paratroopers have landed, the game ends and a huge tank appears, trundles up and blasts you into pieces. I mean, where the hell did that come from? Anyway, I guess it was 1983, and it is after all a 16k game. I enjoyed playing this despite the dodgy controls, and before I knew it nearly 40 minutes had passed. And even after writing this review, I went back for another go. A good example then of a simplistic game that plays really well. Why not give it a try? Dingo, released in 2011 by TARDIS Remakes, was a project to convert the arcade game of the same name over to the Spectrum. The reason behind the idea was that the creators of the arcade game were Ashby Computers and Graphics, better known to Spectrum fans as Ultimate Play the Game. The arcade version released in 1983 was a simple maze game where their main character had to run around collecting fruit and avoiding the chasing dingoes. Strangely, this arcade game never made it to the Spectrum, although you can see similarities in the graphics to Ultimate Sabre Wolf. The arcade game used a different screen ratio to the Spectrum, so obviously things had to be changed slightly. Despite this though, this is a cracking conversion and great fun to play. The main character has to charge around the screen collecting fruit before the dingoes grab it. This can be done either on a random basis or aiming for the highest scoring fruit, which is highlighted at the beginning of each level. The dingoes can, and do, throw fruit at you, which means there's an additional hazard to watch out for. Luckily though, you can throw it back, but obviously this loses points. The graphics and music were done by Mark Jones, a name that may be familiar to older gamers as he worked for Ocean Software, and is now a regular on the Spectrum scene. There's nothing spectacular about the game, either the arcade or the Spectrum version, but it is a faithful creation, and plays really well and there's not a lot more you could really ask for. Control is a bit tricky sometimes, as you have to get the alignment just right, or you can get yourself stuck in corners as the dingoes close in. So overall, nice tunes, good graphics, and nice playability. So if you like maze games, grab yourself a copy and give it a try. That's the end of this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to help making the next one, get in touch via the details below. See you soon.